to the Word of God. Let's pray together. Father, we are, have been in worship from the moment that we arrived, and we are asking now to come into our hearts and mind. Help us, Lord, to understand what does it mean to be a part of the mission, to be part of this prophetic message and mission that you placed in our hearts and mind. Why are we here, Lord? Make it clear as we ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. I want you to imagine with me that it is a beautiful day in Fairview, Texas. Now, it's not hard to do because we live in Texas and we get beautiful days, sometimes even over the summer, north of 100 degrees. And so it's a beautiful day like this. And imagine you're walking down the sidewalk right here on Stacy Road and you get to that place where you're just adjacent to the mall, right, next, right adjacent to Stacy. And out of the corner of your eye, you see this individual come out of the side entrance of Macy's and he's moving swiftly in your direction. He's wearing a trench coat and he's carrying a black briefcase. And, he's, and he comes up to you and he says, stop right there. And he opens up the briefcase. He opens it up. And right inside the briefcase is a $1 million in cash. I mean, this is not too hard to imagine, right? I mean, <clears throat> it happens all the time in the state of Texas. You got a bunch of billionaires, millionaires. He opens it up and he says to you, as he's showing it, this can be yours. And immediately in your mind, what are you thinking? You're thinking of all of the things that you can buy, all of the things that places I would go, places I would see. And, and that's running through your mind. And you think, well, all the things I can buy. And immediately you think about make me a sanctuary project. I can actually build and contribute to the construction of the church. Right? And, and you know, you have all of these dreams that are going through your mind. And the man says, but there's one condition. And you say, what is it? I need you to answer one question. And it has to be answered correctly. What's the question? And he says, the question is, what is the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And immediately, immediately in your mind, you're, you're wondering, hmm, I wonder why these millionaires don't seem to have much to do in Fairview, Texas, other than to ask us these religious questions. And you're thinking to yourself, hmm, I know that answer. I know, after all, I attend a Seventh-day Adventist church. And you're like, hmm, um, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, oh, it's... I'm sorry, too late. Closes the briefcase and he heads back into Macy's. And let's just imagine that seven other Seventh-day Adventists, one by one, briefcase opens, million dollars is yours. And I think, oh, oh, the struggle, one by one, one by one. And so my experience is not the guy with the one million dollars in the briefcase. My experience is that you would probably or maybe many of us we would get seven different answers to that question to the question that you see on the screen in fact i'm going to go one step further many times the question has no interest to us you, you know it's just flying over your head because ignorance is part of apathy sometimes they just go together hand in hand what is the mission of the seventh day adventist church even when confronted with the proposition of receiving one million dollars we might be hard-pressed to come up with the right answer. Now, I have done this before, but not with the briefcase and certainly not full of money. Even when confronted with that question, and when I've done this in a classroom setting where you're in front of a whiteboard marker and you're just writing down the responses from a group of individuals, and you're writing them down, there are people, when asked this question, eventually people start having the wheels turn in their head. And they said, I know the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have the answer. Pastor, the answer to the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to love God. And you're thinking, oh, wow, that's great. Not bad, right? I mean, to love God. In fact, our Methodist friends, they would probably say, hey, I like that. Wow, that's amazing. Because it actually sounds familiar. That kind of sounds like what we do, too. Another person would often say, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second. I know the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to serve people 
as Jesus would have us serve them. And of course, our Baptist friends, they turn around and they say, wow, that sounds familiar. That sounds awfully, you know, what we also do. And on and on. But yet there's one person who says, well, wait a minute, Pastor Frank, I have the answer. I know what the answer is. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to know God and to make him known. Wow. What do you think of that one? You think that's, that's, that's a good mission? Some are saying, oh, they, you know, they don't know. You know. And yet the Catholic Church will say, hey, our friends, man, this is very interesting because that sounds very familiar. That's the kind of stuff like we like to do too. And then someone, out of frustration, they get up and they say, wait, pastor, I know what the answer is. The mission of the Seventh-day Adventist church is simply to fulfill the great commission of Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, that has traction. That has a lot of traction. In fact, I want you to take a look at that with me this morning. Because in the first gospel of the New Testament, Matthew, in chapter 28, Jesus makes a final statement that we have here in the entirety of the Gospel of Matthew. It is said that during his earthly ministry, it was perhaps the quintessential, the summary, you can say, of what Jesus intended for his people. And I can understand, in fact, I can see why someone would say, hey, you need to check this out. You need to check this out. This is the mission. Are you ready? Let's take a look at it. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. Then Jesus came to the disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How much authority, according to Jesus, has been given? How much, everyone? How much of all is all? It's, it's everything, right? All authority in heaven. And so now notice what Jesus asks us to do in response to the authority that he is now going to give. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven, on earth, and I'm going to do something. Notice the response in verse 19. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I want to be crystal clear here, guys. Any church, <clears throat> including this one, that calls itself Christian must be about the business of fulfilling the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28. I, I mean, think about this. You know, any church that calls itself Christian has to be about this business. Many times we think that it ends with baptism when we get baptized. No, 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 no. Actually, it's just the beginning. It is just the, the, the precursor to making fully devoted followers that are taught to obey everything. That's what Jesus says. Everything that Jesus commanded. Making fully devoted followers. And if there's... I want you to listen to what I'm about to say right now. If that's all there is in our mission, think about this. If that's all there is in our mission, the sooner that we go and lock the front doors of this building, we begin selling this building. In fact, actually selling the land that surrounds the building in which it actually sits on and put a for sale by owner or maybe just a for sale sign on the lawn. <clears throat> the sooner that we do that, the better. Because <clears throat> every Christian denomination out there who claims this same mission has the same mission as well because that's their mission too they say that's great i mean we're all about the great commission they were he we're actually here to make disciples for jesus christ come and join us brothers and sisters have you ever stopped to ponder let i want you to reflect with me for a moment have you ever stopped to ponder the arrogance required to actually have the same mission as everybody else? You know, and still, believe it or not, maintain our own buildings, our own hospitals, our own universities, our own academies, our own institutions, elementary schools. I mean, this is just arrogance and, of course, terribly inefficient. But I noticed that something actually happened when you guys arrived here this morning. You, 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 did you notice what happened? You're still inside the building. 
You, you're actually in it. It wasn't locked when you came this morning. Th- there was, the doors were unlocked. The, actually, you didn't even see a for sale sign on the grass, on the lawn. At least that's the, how it seemed that way this morning when we came for first service. Because even though, even though we share a great deal with other Christian entities, even though we participate fully and passionately and completely with the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, even though all of those things are true, ultimately our mission is different. It, it is not the same as everyone else out there. You understand what I'm saying? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Why is that? Because we take the Great Commission, we take it one final step further. Would you like to know what the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is? Would you like to know what it is? I, I, actually, I, I'm going to be a little bold. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you would, raise your hands, how many of you would actually like to know what the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is? Oh, wonderful. Then I'm going to invite you to come back next week for the answer. Actually, no, let me stop. Not next week. It's going to be the week after because next week is the youth rally. You know, I, 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 I want to tell you that at least I'm going to try to begin telling you that this is actually the first part of a four-part series that I'm going to, we're going to be exploring the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We've entitled it Our Mission or The Mission. Why are we here? Why are we here? It's going to explore the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its unique message and mission and I would like you to know not just about the mission, but I want to encourage you to look at this mission in a little bit more detail. So if you're visiting with us for the first time, I want to invite you to come back. Come back or maybe even follow us online because I want to make sure that we get this right. And the reason I want to make sure that we get this right because this is important stuff. If we get it wrong, it will ultimately impact millions of people for eternity. It's really, 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 really important stuff. Not because I say so, but because Christ himself has said so. He actually, now, now is the reason why, <clears throat> why we're actually exploring this, because we're going to be diving in to a series in just a few weeks from now. But the reason why I'm not plunging into this message right now regarding the, the, you know, the mission of the church is because there's something that we have to take into consideration. We need to take care first. We need to revisit and lay a foundation that will help us understand the unique message and mission. It's the foundation. From, and for some reason, this foundation has been neglected over time in my estimation. And I believe that we need to recapture this in order for good things to happen. And so I want to take you to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, if you go ahead and make your way there, I'm going to confess to you this morning that in this series, I'm going to actually cut a few corners. I'm going to make some, some jumps here and there with the hope that you have prior knowledge on your end. Because if I, if I have someone who's actually visiting for the first time, a guest, if you are here and you're going to probably be wondering, well, I, I can see how he started, but I don't know how he ended there from here, then come see me afterwards. I'll be more than happy to sit down and chat with you so that you can actually see how we actually arrived to this. But in the interest of time, I only have two hours to do this message. <laughs> hey, <laughs> amen. Actually, that's a joke. That's, that's a joke, guys. That's not true. That's not true. I actually have to be picky. I have to pick and choose the things I'm going to cover, and I'm going to start right now. In Revelation chapter 12, let me give you a little bit of a background. Revelation chapter 12, in the beginning of the chapter, there's this pure woman. She's got the moon, the sun, the stars on her head that she is adorned with, and she represents what? What does this woman represent? She represents the church. She represents God's people in the Old Testament, the, you know, the Jewish nation, and then by extension, the New Testament church. So this is the New Testament era. But there is a son that's even born to this woman. The son represents who? It represents Jesus. And there is a dragon, the villain. The dragon represents Satan. 
Now, the text is explicit about who the dragon represents. It's not easy. It's not hard to figure out who he represents. When Jesus is crucified, he actually lies in the grave and he is now resurrected and goes back to heaven and is inaugurated into the heavenly sanctuary as our high priest. When that happens, Satan is cast to the planet and there is where we begin the story. I want you to join me. Go ahead. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. It says, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had been given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. This is a time of representation of terrible persecution. This is not the only persecution of God's people that, that we're actually we're going to experience. But it is an intense time that lasted for a time, times, and half a time. How long is that in years? A time, time, and half a time. Yes, that's 1,260 years from the start of 538 A.D. all the way to 70, 1798 A.D. It is that time of intense persecution, but it continues. Verse 15. Then from the mouth of the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and swept her away with a torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon has spewed out of of his mouth verse 17 then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went he went off and now notice what happens here it says he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring the rest of her offspring now john the revelator gives a descriptor for that he says those who keep the commandments of god and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. You know, in the Greek language, that word there, the rest, you know, that we're reading, the rest of her offspring, that word there is loipon. It actually is a word that means remnant, something that remains, that which remains of the woman's seed. In other words, this is the last group of people on, on planet Earth just prior to the second coming of Jesus. And if we were to say, Man, this is great. This is great. I want to know more about how can I identify this particular group? Well, you can identify them at least with two characteristics. How many characteristics, everyone? Two. And we already saw them. The first one is that they keep the what? The commandments of God. And secondly, it is called they have something else. What else do they have besides keeping the commandments of God? What else do they have? It's called the testimony of Jesus. And I'm wondering, what is that? You know, you don't have to wonder if you're wondering along with me, because if you look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, we don't have time to go there. It says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so it's very easy to find these answers, these questions, because the spirit of prophecy, in other words, if you want to identify this last group of God's people, we need to look for a group at a bare minimum that do what? that keep the commandments of God and take prophecy seriously. They take God's commandments seriously and they take prophecy seriously. It has the spirit of prophecy. That is the gift of prophecy that's expressed within them, that takes the Bible prophecy of the Old Testament seriously, that takes the Bible prophecy of the New Testament seriously and preaches and teaches Bible prophecy and appreciates it. That's God's remnant people. Well, how wouldn't you know it? That in the middle of the 1800s, there came a group of people headed by a retired sea captain by the name of Joseph Bates, along with and matched with a young married couple, Ellen and James White, along with other leaders, a tiny little group that began to slowly grow and 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 teach bible prophecy including the ultimate ultimate the bible prophecy of revelation chapter 17 here that we have just read they came to see themselves they 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 saw themselves as a group of people who were called into existence by god himself and they were confirmed with miraculous visions 
miraculous and divine phenomena commanded to prepare the world, not for the first coming, but for the second coming of Christ. And I'll tell you what, that must have been an impossible task. Can you imagine being called to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus? I mean, what a job. As impossible as that may have seemed, it turns out that a handful of people that started with them ended up forming the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, which now numbers more than 20 million people around the globe. I mean, that's amazing. From a small little group that started out in such a small beginning with with more than 221 plus million people around the globe. And you know, Ellen White has become the most published female author of any religious topic in the history of our world. In fact, she was so influential during her time that even to this date, in 2014, the Smithsonian Magazine named her as one of the top 100 influential Americans of her time. And thanks to her commitment and all countless of other individuals, the Seventh-day Adventist Church today has the largest Protestant school system in the world. And we also have the largest health system in the world with more than 500 500 institutions in 65 different countries. In fact, our church membership on the ground consists of local churches, which is growing by leaps and bounds. Globally, they're growing strong, meeting with fantastic success. Except, except, except in the global West. You know what that means? You understand? That's us in the United States, Europe, UK, Australia. In the West, we have not been keeping up with the rest of the world. In fact, if you, they're actually quite ahead of us. And it's not that we're not growing. I don't want you to get the misunderstand, misunderstand what I'm saying. It's not that we're not growing. If you look at the stats, we're actually ahead of the rest of the world as well. But the bar is really quite low down here. It's really quite low. When you think about that, add to the same fire, the vigor, the commitment, the, 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 you know, the courage to, that some are strong in other parts of the world and the Advent movement is still running strong in those parts of the world. And so in my mind, I wonder to myself, if we might benefit here in the West from a reminder, from a refresher course on what it means to be a prophetic movement, if for any reason, perhaps we can recapture the Christ-centered passion of our prophetic mission that our forefathers, our foremothers had, and will allow God and the moving of the Holy Spirit in our lives to revive us, that change will ultimately work and will finish that work in our hearts and minds that we would be able to go home. How many of you would like to see this happen? Would you like to see that happen? I mean, I don't know about you, but I would love to see that happen. I mean, we live in a neighborhood that's no longer hospitable for us. I mean, we're on this part of the corner of the galaxy that isn't so friendly, and it's time to go home. And so if this is going to happen, if revival that's going to, that has been prophesied is going to happen, to come to pass, I would suggest that we can move in that direction by asking and answering at least one question. And here it is. What does it mean to be a prophet for God? What does it mean to be a prophet for God? It, you and I, we're part of a, of a prophetic movement of God. And if we can study how God led the individual prophets in the Bible, we will, be, we will gain a better understanding of how we as a people, as a prophetic movement, can function best. All of which, in, in my way of thinking, is absolutely essential when we begin when we cover and begin next week. Because I want to look at the unique message and the mission, message and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so let's go to it. Let's look at three brief lessons. How many lessons did I just say? Three brief lessons on prophets and prophetic movements. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. 
And beginning in verse 16, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 16. This is what the Lord says. He says, do not listen to the prophets. Now, these are false prophets because at the time of Jeremiah, in that particular time, Jeremiah was actually dealing with Israel. Israel is in apostasy and God sent him the true prophet to speak to Israel. But yet there is just there are so many false prophets that outnumber Jeremiah easily. And so when you read all of the details in this story, the false prophets, they're just everywhere. They begin to say things that are not true. And notice what Jeremiah here says as God is speaking to him. He says, do not let, do not listen to what the prophets, these are the false prophets, are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord? Who has listened to who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purpose on his heart. In days to come, you will understand clearly, I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. Prophetic lesson number one. Let's put it on the screen. Prophets are to do and say what God commands them to do and say. Make sense? I know you're probably thinking, man, pastor, I was expecting something deep and profound. I'm trying to be practical here, all right? God commands them, and they are to do and to say what God commands them to, to actually say. Now, this is what God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is trying to get across. And this is the crust of the problem. The crust of the problem is that it's not up to committees. It's not up to individuals. It's not up to sidebar conversations. God's prophets and God's prophetic movement is dictated by God himself. Which brings us to lesson number two. And I'm going to actually give you a few verses to look at that will actually be able, when you read them, I think you'll be able to know what lesson number two is. Let's begin with Isaiah chapter 20. Isaiah chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. In the year that the supreme commander sent by Sargon, king of Assyria, came to Ashdod and attacked and captured it, at the time the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, he said to him, take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around naked and barefooted. Then the Lord said, Just as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefooted for three years as a sign and omen against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will be led away, the captives of Egypt and all of the exiles of Cush, young and old, naked and barefoot, to Egypt's shame. Look at Ezekiel chapter 5. Ezekiel chapter 5. Verse 1, he says, Now, son of man, God is speaking to Ezekiel. Take a sharp sword and use it as a barber's razor and shave your head and your beard. Then take a set of scales, divide up your hair. When the days of your siege come to an end, burn a third of the hair inside the city. Take a third and strike it with the sword all around the city and scatter a third to the wind. For I will pursue them with drawn sword, but take a few hairs and tuck them away in the folds of your garment. A few strands of hair, like a remnant. I want you to look at this one. Perhaps the greatest prophet in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. The greatest prophet here, beginning in verse 22 of chapter 8. Then they came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a, bland, a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and he led him outside the village. 
when he had spit, what did Jesus just do? He just spit. He spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him. And Jesus asked them, do you see anything? You know, if your optometrist is doing something like this to you, go find another doctor. I mean, can, can you see what lesson number two is? It's practically shouting at you. You know what lesson number two is? Lesson number two is this. God often commands prophets to do and to say strange things. It's, it's, it's not even debatable. I mean, you look at the evidence here. And by the way, where does all this come from? The, life's, the life of a true prophet of God is simply not normal. They, they, they're, they're driven with a purpose to follow what God is asking them to do. But yet at the same time, many people who often look at prophets, they get to, the, to their wit's end and they try to figure out how the rules apply to prophets. Because it seems like they have different rules for prophets than for other people. And you see the average person who's following God, they come to a place in salvation history. And when it comes to prophets, on the average day in the office, they're just shaving their head, you know, with a sword. And, uh, and they're weighing their hair on scales. And you're wondering, how does this work? Being a prophet of God is not a normal thing. And sometimes they're asked to do some strange things. And let me tell you, I want to be clear what I'm saying here. I want to be crystal clear what I'm about to say. Because just because God sometimes calls his people in a prophetic movement to say strange things does not mean that we embrace everything that is strange. You understand? Do you follow me? You understand what I'm saying? Nor does it mean that everything that we do must be strange in order for it to be from God. And honestly... I mean, the Adventist church, if you really begin to look at this, we have it pretty easy, don't we? I mean, compared to others, I, I, I mean, think about this. I, I, don't, I, I have never been asked to shave my head for God. And, I, and I'm sure that none of you have, haven't either. I mean, we're not spitting in people's faces. Are you spitting in people's faces? I mean, I, I don't know about you, praise God, because I'm not a fan of spitting in people's faces. And I don't think that's a you know, kind thing to do. But there are many others that it communicate their voices with regards to, the, to this Advent message and mission, that the message was, unfortunately, for their time. It's not applicable now. And they get very sophisticated, very, very, uh, you know, very quick to try to dismiss it. They say, you know, this actually, this message that started around the 160, about 170 years ago, should have been fulfilled by now. So if it hasn't been fulfilled, ah, that means that it's beyond its shelf life. You know, it's just no longer usable. And to that critique, I would like to respond with this. When you look at the books of Revelation and Daniel, the book of Revelation was written towards the end of the first century, 90 AD, 92 AD. And yet the book of Daniel in the sixth century BC, we're talking you know, if you stop to think about it, pay attention to the scriptures. And I bring those two books out because they're companion books. They're companion books. And we built, we built a lot uh, uh, and we consider them to be extremely important to helping us understand our own identity, our own calling and to who we are as a people. In fact, more than 2,000 years ago, when you consider those two books, I mean, that's a pretty good shelf life, don't you think? I mean, think about it. And for those who think that that prophecy didn't last 170 years, we're just going to go ahead, it just doesn't work? How does that work exactly? How does it really work? And this notion that we've gotten so advanced, I mean, we are so advanced and so sophisticated, we no longer need prophecy any longer. You know, to that, I can tell you that every time I turn on my computer, or go on social media, I can tell you that no modern procedures or advanced directive is bringing us any closer to the second coming of Jesus. And so here's the point. It doesn't matter the technology. It doesn't matter. What does matter is not what we have been and what is being said as to the critiques of this. I believe what matters is a respect for the loyalty to God's calling, God's calling and God's promises. You see, when you're dealing with a human promise, you can take it or leave it. 
because who knows how long it's going to last. But when God promises something, it's going to stick. It's going it's to actually stay. In fact, even the disciples had to deal with this even in their time. Go to 2 Peter. I want you to quickly look at this. Notice what 2 Peter says, how he said it at that very point in his time. And notice who he's talking to. 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, Dear friends, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholeness, to wholeness of thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets. Notice who he's speaking to about the holy prophets and command that was given by our Lord and Savior through your prof- through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers coming, scoffing and following their own evil desires, they will say, where is the coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as if has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that as long as God's word, the, as long as God's word, the heavens came into existence, being on the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the word of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth were reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget just one thing, dear friends, he says. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day, and the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not waiting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Because the day of the Lord will what, everyone? The day of the Lord will come. That's the promise, that the day of the Lord will come. You know, I don't know how old these prophets were, but those prophets who Peter was writing to, we're talking four or five hundred years, still relevant, still relevant, obviously very relevant to the spirit of God that inspired Peter to point this out to the people. And so how do we know? Because there's the ground we're actually standing on, the firm ground in the promise of the second coming, unfulfilled promises, the prophecies that we are looking at and that we will be looking at is just as certain that God is the God who is sitting on the throne and is pointing us in that direction. All right. The last one, which brings us to the final lesson. Lesson number three, go to Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one, verse 14. Here it is, the final lesson, number three. Mark chapter one, verse 14 And John was put in prison. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. And it says the time, he says, in verse 15, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the what? Repent and what? Believe the good news. Believe, repent, believe in the good news. And so so lesson number three is simply this. Prophets say and do strange things because God is trying to rescue them from disaster. Think about it. He has just been anointed the Messiah there. And would you, if you have not seen or read the experience when Jesus, when that dove comes down, descends upon him, and he is anointed from 457 to 27 AD, Jesus, the Son of God, is anointed. He begins his ministry as the Messiah, as the anointed one, because he's calling them to repent and believe the good news because he's trying to rescue people from all disaster. And so as we begin to close, prophets are to say and do things that God commands them to say. He often commands these prophets to do strange things, but because he's actually, in number three, calling them, because he is using them, using us to rescue people from disaster. You know, God is deadly serious, guys. And I'll tell you, the peculiarness has a point. It has a point. It has a point that God is making. And so I want you to know, and I want to be crystal clear, We don't despair 
about the future. Because the finest hour of God's church lies just before us. It does. I mean, the finest hour, we're not going to cave to pressure. We're not going to give into this theological fad or fashions. You know, and we're not, we're not going to turn around, but rather we're going to stand on the firm promise, on the blood of Christ Jesus and on the promise of the Holy Spirit to stand firm. Stand firm on what we will do that God has asked us to do. And what we will see that what God has asked us to do as we move forward in, that fo- in, in those footsteps by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us, that work will be finished. We're living in the finest hour, folks. It lies just before us. And I remember that verse. I remember that day where it says in that verse that it will dawn when the morning star, Christ Jesus, will rise in our hearts and will ultimately, in that sky, we will see him coming in the clouds of heaven to meet us so that we can be with him. Amen? I don't know about you guys, but I want that to be a reality for us. I'm going to invite our singers to come, and while they come to have our closing hymn, I want to pray this morning for each of us. I want to, I want to have a prayer that as we look at our message, our, 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 our message, our mission, that we would begin looking at that message and mission from the standpoint of what God has is given to us and applying not only to our personal lives, but to other people who we come in contact with. Let's pray together. Father, may the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon us. Help us to not just simply go through the motions. You know our hearts. You know us better than we know ourselves. Father, please, I pray that you will grant us holy boldness, not just simply to live out the prophetic mission that you've given us, but to proclaim the prophetic message that you've provided. As we thank you 